Uh, my name is Simon Persaus. Uh, I'm, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from Sheffield. I'm a Yorkshireman originally, and then I moved across here to Liverpool 18 years ago now. Blimey O'Reilly. Um, came here for university. I went to a place called Lipper, which is like a performing arts kind of gaff, but um, I didn't do any singing or dancing, as you may be surprised to hear. Uh, I studied the management degree, which is like music business management and this, that, the other. Um, I work for Centric Music. We're an independent music publisher. It's a company that started when I was still at university. So it's kind of like a university project that's really got out of hand. So in this course that I did, you had to do like a three month work placement, which is kind of standard, you know, like before I went to university, I did work placements at different labels and they start new with the one in Manchester, um, you know, as a way to kind of like get some experience in the real life scary music industry. Uh, but as part of that third year of that course, you had to actually do a three month work placement and Chris, who I work with, he had this initial idea of the company, which is Century Music, which is basically a really artist friendly music publishing deal, which I'll talk about in a second what that means. Uh, so he got some money together. He wrote a business plan, got some people to say, like, yes, we'll, we'll give this a go. And then he asked me if I wanted to get involved and help start it, basically. So we started signing artists and talking to musicians. And this was, yeah, 16 years ago. And you fast forward to where we are now, and there are just under 90 members of staff at Centric. Uh, we look after well over kind of 2 million songs, and we look after songwriters and artists, ranging from people who are writing their first ever songs to people who've sold millions and are top of the charts. So at the moment, uh, one of our producers got a beat on the new Getz album, which is a, a Getz featuring Ed Sheeran song. Uh, and that looks like it could be number one this week if August to plan in the album chart, which is great. Um, so music publishing, just to give you a bit of an idea, when you talk about musicians and songs, there's kind of two main copyrights. There's the master copyright, which is looked after by record labels. You probably all have heard of labels, you know, Universal, Island, uh, XL, Beggars, etc. But then you also have publishing copyrights. So publishing copyrights are the songs rather than the recordings. So the master rights and the record labels look, to, look after the recordings, what you're listening to. And then publishers look after the songs and the people who wrote them. So that's what we do at Centric. Because quite often they can be two different things. If you're someone who writes your own songs and then performs them, then you get both of these bits of income. But there's a hell of a lot of people out there who just write songs and give them to other people to perform. So I think on average last year, the average number one had about six or seven songwriters on there you know and usually the song will only have like a person singing it so there's five people behind the scenes who help to make that song happen and it's our job to make sure they get paid for that basically so for example we look after a couple of writers who on drake's one dance and we've got some writers who are on bound by kenya west or we look after some songwriters from a track that was released in like the 70s um, that Jay-Z sampled and used on Empire State of Mind. So we make sure that those guys get paid for their songwriting. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of how I started doing this, well, I pretty much went into that. Yep, it was a university project that I'm still doing now, 15 years later, which I didn't expect to happen, to be honest. Uh, but it was a pretty pleasant surprise. Um, I kind of did this. I said yes to doing this at university as a project thinking it would give me something to do and I'd be quite busy. Um, I was hoping to go work in radio, to be honest, but this has all been quite a, a fun journey so far. And I, it wasn't until a bit later on, later on, quote, in life that I thought about music. So I've always been, music's always been my passion, if you will. It's always been my favourite thing uh, in the world, really, not to sound all softy, uh, but it was always just a hobby. It was always just something I consumed, like most people do. I was all set to go work in the tiling industry with my dad who does tiling and soft floor laying back in Sheffield in Rotherham. And uh, like in the summers in between school, I used to go and do soft floor laying and tiling in local schools and whoever needed it done. And I just kind of expected I'd go down that route as well. And then I went to a gig when I was like 17. I went to go see Foo Fighters and it was like a pretty, it was an amazing gig. And I just had quite like a bit of a euphoric experience and I just thought like I tell you what I want this to be my career and I don't want it just to be my hobby 
so I kind of started pursuing it there really um which is which is nice yeah I mean you know you, I, I thought it was quite frustrated where moving when I was younger like no one ever said to me when I was growing up or throughout school or throughout education that being working in the music industry was a legitimate career path to do you know when I was at school my music lessons consisted of watching West Side Story and playing like Happy Birthday on really shit keyboards um, at no point did anyone ever say to you there is this entire industry like the music industry was just the person on stage singing but there's so much behind the scenes that happen from music publishers to the record labels to people who put on gigs to people who make gigs happen to people who do press to people who do photography to people who set up venues you know there is a huge huge industry for every person there is on stage performing a song or releasing music there's you know a thousand people behind them making this whole industry kind of work um so um, even when i thought to myself oh yeah i quite fancy a job i quite fancy doing music as a job what i do at the moment in terms of music publishing that never crossed my mind because i mean some of you may have heard of it before but before i went to university i had no idea about what pu music publishing was what songwriters did how they earn a living etc so it was kind of a it was a nice thing to stumble upon should we say um, in terms of what my typical day at work is, <clears throat> my work day is kind of split 50-50 between <laughs> talking to people. Good grief, I talk to people. Um, I've done 31 calls in four days this week, uh, which is arguably too too much talking, but talking to artists, songwriters, managers, uh, record labels, other publishers, um, basically anyone who will listen to me talk about Centric this is what I do uh, constantly, some may say. So it, I suppose it, in a way it's, it's sales because I'm trying to convince songwriters and artists to use us at Centric over our competitors. So it's listening to their music. It's, you know, talking about what we think we can do with it. Because another big thing of what we do at Centric is getting their music used on stuff, which is called synchronization, basically. So if you watch Sky Sports or if you watch football or whatever, all that music in the background, we kind of pitch that from our catalogue and hope that they'll use it. Um, so if you see the new iPhone advert, that's one of our artists and their songs. If you've got the latest FIFA, there's a couple of our tracks on there. Um, we do quite a lot in computer games. So we've got stuff on NHL, NFL, about a game called Sackboy that came out. Um, if any of you watched programmes like that normal people that was on TV last year. And apparently that was the most Shazam TV show. Uh, we had like about 20% of all the music used on that TV show was from Centric. So that's quite cool. So it's talking to all these people um, and trying to convince them, yes, to use Centric over us. So that's one thing that I do. And then the other side of stuff is looking after our kind of priority artists and making sure they're happy and helping develop their talent really. So, for example, we look after certain songwriters like a guy called Kieran Shudall, who is a lead singer and songwriter of a band called Circa Waves, who were a Scouse band, and they've had four top ten albums now. Last album went top three. Um, so, you know, when he's in between writing albums, he's constantly writing demos that could be for the next Circa Waves album or could be for another artist that will pitch out to them and say, like, do you want to work with them? Um, other songwriters get really involved where they'll send me demos from like really first ideas and we'll go back and forth and I'll say like really like this part of the song but I think this part of the song could be better you need to change them lyrics to make them a bit more accessible you need to bring in the chorus a bit earlier so therefore it's got more chance of being played on radio this is called A&R basically artist and repertoire and it's just helping songwriters become the best kind of songwriter they can be despite the fact I can't write songs myself but I know I can't but obviously I listen to music all the time, which is a, a perk of the job. And you, there's certain trends and there's certain things that happen that you know will result in them getting played on Radio 1 or it will result in them getting featured by Spotify on a kind of major playlist. So my kind of day-to-day -day is a mix between talking to the artists that we currently have on Centric who were kind of really important to us and then also talking to artists not on Centric and trying to get them involved and working with us. Um, what difference does your job make? Good grief. There's a question. Uh, one thing that's quite nice is, especially on that thing I talked about with synchronization, getting music used on TV and adverts and things like that, it can generate a lot of cash. 
So there's some artists who, as you can potentially imagine, making money from music and making enough money from music to sustain a living and to make it a career uh, isn't easy in this day and age because there's, as we speak, there's 22 million tracks on Spotify. Um, there's a song a second being uploaded to Spotify. So there's there's a lot of music to listen to, but not that much money to kind of be shared out between everyone. So if we manage to get an artist song used on a TV advert, which generates a lot of money, it can genuinely help change change their lives. That sounds like it's got a lot of gravitas there, but we've had artists who have been able to quit a day job just to focus on music because we've made them a hell of a lot of money because we've had their track used on a Ford advert for like £100,000, for example. So there's an element there of, you know, I suppose that does make a difference. Um I mean, it doesn't make nowhere near, near as much a difference as my friends who are nurses and doctors and students, et cetera. Um, but, you know, hopefully there are some people out there who we do stuff for that genuinely helps them kind of achieve something. You know, we have artists who the first time we send them 50 quid, um, that changes everything. You know, they'll email back saying, I've never made money from music before. This kind of, this legitimizes the fact that why I do what I do. Uh, that's always quite nice so we do a hell of a lot of education here at century where we'll go and do like talks about what music publishing is which is aimed at people mu making music for the first time to tell them about music publishing to tell them how they make how they should make money what money's out there how to collect it properly um and you know just trying to educate people to make sure they're getting every single penny that they're owed for doing what they're doing uh, which a hell of a lot of people don't so Hopefully, hopefully that helps in terms of making a difference. Oh, I hope so. Um, what's challenging about my work? Keeping a lot of people happy. Um, as you can imagine, songwriters and artists are very precious about their work because when they write a song, this is their work. This is their art. This is what they're trying to portray to the world. And sometimes it might not be great. <laughs> It might need a bit of help. Um, it might need a bit of steering in the right direction. And again, because like I said, 22 million songs on Spotify, your competition, if you're a musician, is so fierce. So being able to talk to artists in a way that you say like, look, I, you know, this is good, but it's not good enough. It needs to be better. And doing it in a way which kind of helps them realize how they can be the best songwriter that they are can be quite challenging because sometimes you can say something to them, they can be they can take it the wrong way and think that you're just not on board with their vision and what they're trying to achieve and taking criticism for anyone is is tough enough do you know what i mean so as an artist as well we have we have to deal with some very delicate egos yeah um all right i was um, just wondering in regard to the synchronization yeah what's your take on the um idea of covers or creative covers it's a big part of sync. Um, so obviously at Centric, we can only pitch cover versions of songs that we also look after. Um, so when a sync happens, say like Ford wants to use a song and they have a hundred thousand pounds budget to pay for a song. That means 50,000 pounds usually goes to the record label who owns the recording and 50,000 pounds goes to the person who wrote the song and the publisher. Um, if they want to use a mega famous song, £50,000 won't be enough because they'll need to pay a hell of a lot more. So what they can do is get someone to do a cover version and they'll pay the person who wrote the song £90,000, but they'll pay the person who does a cover version £10,000 because this person might not well be as well known because uh, basically what they're paying for there is the familiarity of the song that everyone kind of knows. So a hell of a lot of emerging artists and people starting out do covers knowing that they won't get paid the same amount of money as the person who wrote the mega famous hit song will do but it's a way to earn still still earn a bit of money themselves and also get their name out there and get some exposure out there because obviously there's been a lot of people over the years who have used that as a bit of a springboard um to be like you know no one's heard of me before but i've had a really good cover that's streamed a lot and been used on adverts and it's kind of helped them become something i think birdie's probably a good example of that like her first album when she was very young was pretty much all covers if i've got that right and then she started writing her own songs writing with other people and became kind of an artist in her own right so at centric some of the big songs that we look after for example we look after it's the most wonderful time of the year which is obviously a huge christmas song um and we've got 
you know, like I think if you look on Spotify, there's over three, 300 versions of that song on Spotify alone. But if anyone wanted to license any one of those 300 versions on the on an advert in the UK, they would have to come through us to clear the actual song, if that makes sense. Um, so if you're going to do covers, great idea. Just make sure that the artist and the songwriter you're covering is someone who will say yes to their music being synced on stuff. Because there's no point in covering Candle in the Wind. Uh, well, yeah, Candle in the Wind. I didn't mean that. I meant uh, Blowing in the Wind by Bob Dylan. Because someone like Bob Dylan will not let any versions of his music be synced on adverts, for example. Um, but whereas if you look at someone like Queen, you can't can't move for a, a Queen song <laughs> in an advert these days. They're everywhere. So feel free to cover Queen and everywhere in between. So just do your research on the artists that you're going to cover and if they've ever licensed their music before on adverts or anything like that. Uh, I was going to ask as well, um, how do you find your like talent? Is it just about scouting through Spotify or is it like? Um, Centric is, is free to join so the service that we do anyone can join as long as you're making original music and you're writing your own songs you can sign up on centricmusic.com and then we do all the things that a music publisher does do so you know since we started this company there's 60,000 plus people who've, who've used that service and every single artist who signs up we listen to and you know it's all about finding the right place where these artists go in terms of synchronization the biggest um hurdle is production quality um your music before we can pitch it out to anyone has to sound so good because it has to sound as good as every other song in the music industry because that's what you're up against so we can't pitch demos or things that haven't been recorded very well or things that are a bit rough around the edges but once it is very well recorded and it's it's you know quote unquote a, a good song then we try and find the right home for it Obviously, if it's a singer songwriter, then we'll probably send it to dramas and TV programs. If it's a like an indie band, upbeat guitar music, then we'll send it to the sports channels and computer games. Um, if it's hip hop or trap or grime, again, we'll send that to a lot of like fashion brands. We get a lot of music used by Adidas and Nike, stuff like that. So um, I hope that covers everything. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, I'll, I'd try and send you... Uh, well, a band I was in when I was in uni, our uh, stuff, but we're hopefully getting it done when um, our locked we're hopefully getting it fully recorded when lockdown gets finished. Yeah, and hold it, hold it back. At this point. In fact, if um, if you look at my Twitter account, God forbid, <laughs> there is a link. What I'll do straight after this on Twitter, I'm just at Purse House, and I'll tweet a couple of things. One is uh, a post called. What the fuck is music publishing? Which basically tells you everything you need to know about music publishing. And then also this one called Nine Steps to Land a Sync Deal, which is basically if you read that and apply that to your music before pitching it out or send it to anyone, it will really increase your chances of getting listened to. You mentioned up to singer songwriter to trap to that sort of stuff. How far does your music genre go towards? Like, does it go to jazz, classical, folk? How how, how many genres are you? I, I would say I would say every genre I've ever heard of. <laughs> okay. um, we have a lot of stuff. Obviously, in terms of publishing, like it, it doesn't matter what genre or what kind of music you're making. If you're writing original music and it's being streamed or if it's being performed on radio or if you're performing it at a gig when we're allowed to go to gigs, that's generating royalties that us as a publisher can collect for you as a songwriter. So in that sort of things, you're absolutely like, you know, everyone come on board all and sundry in terms of synchronization um obviously some genres are more appealing than others when you watch television you'll see the same kind of music being used over and over again which is usually quite accessible stuff with with big hooks that kind of stick in people's memories but you know there are opportunities out there we've managed to get things like uh we had a thrash metal band called throats um which is just kind of you know, like, oh, they just did that for three minutes and called it a song. But we managed to get that synced on an episode of uh, Fear of the Walking Dead when a man was killing zombies with a baseball bat. So, like, th there are opportunities for all different kinds of music. Um, and then also in the world of elect electronic music, especially, we have a specialist electronic music division. Um, and the subgenres in electronic music are insane there are so many different types of electronic music which i didn't realize until we started working there um i was sent some music the other day which is apparently 
the best ambient Ukrainian techno music I'll ever hear. And I'll tell you what, it was it was the best Ukrainian ambient technology music I've ever heard. Uh, but yeah, a bit of everything. Yeah, so I'm, I'm so, originally I was going to kind of ask you how to get your foot in the door, obviously doing a bit of um, kind of volunteer work and stuff just to kind of get it in, uh, you, know, you know, as I say, get my foot in. But the more you talk, I am a songwriter and an artist, and the more you've kind of been talking, the more I was just going, you know, like, fuck that. I'll actually, you know, kind of, um, but what's the word, kind of like, get, like getting ahead and ask you, like, the best way to kind of, like, pitch if you've already got songs recorded to, like, a good level. Like, I've released three songs. I'm releasing another one tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I was working on one earlier with my producer. And so I've got, I've got another, like, five. And, like, the catchy, the good stuff. I, I always, because I'm a part of... um. I have a part of like your website and like, I always get like the offers of like what to put on. But cool. but I'm all, I'm always like, oh, I'm not that's not exactly what you know what I mean. It's not just it doesn't sync up perfectly with what yeah, I've yeah. So I'm like, I'm not gonna waste anyone's time if it doesn't like fellows talking about Green Day. If I don't sound like Green Day and they're asking for a Green Day track, I'm not gonna go, oh well, you know, this is gonna work. So uh, that by the way, can I just say is is the perfect attitude to have because yeah, because ultimately you know, we, I remember once we had a couple of advert. we had two adverts, one asking for some Daft Punk and one asking for some, I think it was Kanye West, and some dude who wrote folk music pitched his music for both of the briefs, which obviously sounded like neither. And when yeah. you're up against, when you're up against so many different people, you're not up against just the people at Centric. Again, mm-hmm. you're up against the entire music industry. And sometimes you just have to wait for that right brief to come through. Yeah. And the, the other thing to, the other pitfall to not, the other pit to not fall into is try not to start always write music always write the music you want to write don't start writing music with tv or adverts in mind because that's not what people want like people who've got ears that are trained to do what i do um you're gonna hear you're gonna hear through it straight away you're gonna be like all right that person's put a ukulele in there and some hand claps and some whistles because they think it's going to be catchy whereas this is not the music that person actually wants to write um so always write it's kind of art for art's sake if we're going to yeah, be yeah, honest yeah. about it. And then, you know, hopefully eventually it will happen. Is there a way just to like bombard, for example, not like yourself or whatever, just to be like, listen, just like, have you got fucking 10 minutes to, sorry, pardon your language. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of swearing in the music industry, mate, it's fine. So, you know, just like listen to three or four songs and be like, oh, actually, they are quite catchy then, they are quite good for adverts, or just do it the, the, the way through the website. Um, usually it's all done via the website, but again, because because we're here, like I'll, I'm more than happy for Richard to give you my email address and I'll give you some personal feedback. Um, it's just it's so tough. It's yeah. so tough. We look after artists and songwriters who have had top three albums, who've been in the top ten of the charts, and they sometimes can't get synced. So like, there is no right or wrong way of going about it. We have artists who've released one song and then managed to get huge syncs. Like, it sync is amazing but it's very frustrating at the same time so um yeah just be aware of that and i'll give you aggressively honest feedback <laughs> thank you very much it'll be appreciated cheers me <laughs> you're more than welcome but i was going to ask when it eventually does happen again how much work do you do with like um live music um quite a bit so every time you perform live if you perform a song or every time a song that you've written has performed live it generates a royalty so there's kind of two different elements to this um if you performed it at the local like the dog and duck the pub down the end of the road doing like an open mic night everywhere that plays music has to pay an organization called the prs which is the performers Rights society for the right to do so um, and if you perform your copyrights in a pub that means you are owed money for that and it might only be like a fiver, but it's still your fiver. And then if you keep going up and up and up to bigger venues and bigger gigs, it becomes a portion of the ticket price. So, um, for example, if you played the O2 Academy and it's a thousand capacity and you sell, uh, it's sold out at £10 a ticket. So it generates £10,000 in gross ticket sales. 4.2% of that income, 420 quid. Yep goes to the people who wrote the songs that are performed on stage that night. So say if there was a, a headline act that played for an hour and a support act that played for half an hour, the main guys are getting two thirds, the other guys are getting a third, if that makes sense. So in terms of live income, it's huge for Centric. We were one of the biggest publishers in the world for collecting our songwriters 
gigs being performed, uh, songs being performed live. And that is, that is literally ranging from people playing their local pubs to people who are doing arena tours and everything kind of in between. So, you know, we have a songwriter who wrote a lot of songs for, wrote a lot of songs for a boy band, a local boy band actually called Mike Lowry. And they supported Justin Bieber on a European wide arena tour. Um, so every time his copyrights were performed in that arena, it was generating income, which we were kind of collecting for him. So obviously that's where COVID and coronavirus has kind of hit our company because there's just been no income for live gigs for a year now. And it looks like it's going to carry that way for another at least six to nine months. Mm. The only thing you need stamp centric is, is if you have, you've written your own songs, because even if, even if you've not recorded them yet, if you know me and you could write a song together now, and then if the pubs are open, if we went and then performed that song tonight in that pub, that's generated a royalty, which we are owed as songwriters. So even if you've never recorded anything, but your songs are being performed live, then it's generating money, which Century can collect for you. Or if you've recorded songs and put them on Spotify and they're getting streamed, that's generating income that we can collect for you as well. Very, very small amounts of income. Obviously, you need to be getting kind of hundreds of thousands of streams on Spotify et al until that starts generating kind of anything noteworthy. Um, but yeah, Spotify is notoriously stingy on um, dishing money out, isn't it? It's like, isn't it like um, you need to have a hundred thousand streams or something to get a pound? You need to have uh, no, it's, it's, it's different. There's loads of what ifs and maybes. A million streams on Spotify generates five thousand pounds basically, and that that's like four thousand pounds to the master rights, the record label, and one thousand pounds to the publishers and the people who wrote the song. And depending on how you look at the music industry, there's some artists who think that's nowhere near enough. And then there's some artists who, who I know who make a career out of it. So I personally am pro Spotify. I think Spotify, it would be good if they paid songwriters the same amount of money as they paid the record labels. But that's a hangover from the traditional music industry, which if I even start to talk about that now, we would be here for about four hours and I don't want to bore anyone. Um, but that's, if anyone is interested in the music industry and kind of getting more into it and knowing how it works and getting a job in the music industry, especially we're at the stage now where kind of ig ignorance isn't an excuse because there's so much information out there about how the music industry works, which you can look at and read and digest and become acknowledged with for free. So good places to start. Um, there's a daily, there's two daily music industry newsletters, one called music business worldwide and one called CMU Daily. They email everything that's happening in the music industry uh, every single day, and they're free to join. So kind of getting on board with them, reading them every day. Uh, that CMU one, they actually do a podcast called Set List, which is available on Spotify and wherever you listen to podcasts. Again, it's all free. Uh, where they, the two people who run that newsletter talk about the biggest, bits, uh, biggest parts of the music industry and how it's all about. Uh, our blog, like I said before, I'll tweet it after this at Purse House, so you can have a bit of a read of that. So becoming really knowledgeable about the industry, it really helps because there's so many people who want to work in it, and it's it's going to be a bit of a non-starter if just having an interest kind of isn't enough. Do you know what I mean? It is about researching and getting your teeth really into how the music industry works. Because I mean, I've been doing this for 16 years, and it's this industry is constantly changing. Um, it's never sat still from where it is now. And it's, it is quite interesting because there are some people thriving. There are some people really struggling and everywhere in between. Um, just a quick one. So um, I'm aware of, you know, PRS. I understand that that's the UK one. I know that there's like multiple ones around the world. Mm -hmm. So obviously join in centric. Um, I know that you have to pay a membership. Would would you still have to pay the membership for PRS, or is it you know if we sign if I sign up for you, is that membership um, price covered, or do I sign? Um, yeah. So you don't. If you join, yes, yeah, so the PRS is the PRS, the Performing Rights Society, and the PRS is a PRO, which is the Performing Rights Organisation. Yeah. And you're exactly right. Every major territory has their own version. So in Germany, they have Gamer, in France, they have SASM, in Sweden, they have STEM, and so on and so forth. If you're a songwriter, the recommendation is that you should join the PRO of the society where you're making the most money. So even if, say, if you were based here, but for whatever reason, your music was massive in Germany, it would make sense to join Gamer, which is a German, German version of the PRS. 
if you use Centric, you don't have to join the PRS. Um, all that ma all that means there is say for hundred pounds generated, we collect a hundred pounds, we take twenty pounds because we work at a twenty pound commission, and then we give you eighty. If you are a member of the PRS, fifty pound comes directly to you from the PRS. Fifty pounds comes to us. We take our twenty pounds, and then we send you thirty pounds. So you end up with the eighty pounds still, but it's just a bit of a different journey for the money basically. And we recommend that you do join a PRS, a PRO, for example, because it really helps when it comes to overseas income. When we register your copyrights, we register them in all the different PROs all around the world. And if you're a member of the PRS or a PRO, it will result in you getting paid a bit quicker. So you don't have to join a PRO if you're centric, but we do recommend that you do so. And the good thing about it is, as you said, there is a membership fee. I think the PRS at the moment is either 50 or 100 pounds. They keep changing yeah, it. 100. Um, yeah. 100 so you what you can do really is is just join centric if you, if you haven't got 100 quid to spare at the moment because not many of us have um just join centric and then hopefully we'll give you some money and out of that first bit of money we give you you can use that to then join the prs and you know kind of offset that okay um just a quick one as well any um like music business books that you would recommend what are kind of like bibles for you Again, it's tough because the music industry changes so much, but the one I cannot recommend enough, I'm just going to okay. get it up. Can I, I can put a, is there, is there a chat functionality on this talk that I can put a link in? Um, there, there has been usually, but um, for this one, it doesn't seem to have worked for people outside of the Thrive team. So sadly. Tell you what, I'll just tell you, Emily, and write down. <laughs> um, it's called Dissecting the Digital Dollar. And okay. It's by, by a guy called Chris Cook, and Cook is spelled C-O-O-K-E. There's an E on the end of it. Okay. Um, and that was written. So he's one of the two guys behind CMU, the thing that I mentioned earlier on. Yeah, I'm signed up to both of those things you mentioned. And yeah. he, he did that in conjunction with uh, a company called the MMF, which is a music managers forum. Mm -hmm. And basically, it looks at the music industry as it is now and where all this money comes from digitally. So obviously, the music industry is a lot more than just streaming, but at the same time, it's such a big part of it. You have to be very aware of it. So dissecting the digital dollar by Chris Cook is hands down the best book about the music industry out there at the moment. 